نفس إن لم تغفري لا تجزعي All the praise is for Allah who is the author of all existence and the most generous to his creation while he is also the all compelling He is the only one worthy of our worship, having no partners, no associates, no sons, no daughters, no one whom he must consult, and no one or anything which has any comparison with him. All the praise is for Allah, who is the king of all who claim sovereignty, the only one who has the right to legislate for his creatures. He is the giver of life. He is the causer of death, while death has no effect upon him, because he is the ever-living, the self-subsisting, the eternal and the only absolute. All the praise is for Allah, who has power over all things, and there is in reality no power and no strength, no influence to cause benefit or detriment except through him. It is he who created this complex world, the seen and the unseen, the evident and the speculative, the earth and all that is on it and everything that is in it. It is he who sent his messengers and prophets, alayhum salam, with the common message of strict monotheism, which simply means that there is absolutely no one worthy of worship, no one worthy of our obedience, except the Almighty, the One, the Absolute, and who has no partners. The earlier messages which changed the world in the area in which the prophets were sent, those messages we know have changed And even the prophets who brought them, their names are now lost. We just know in general because Allah told us in the Quran, وَلَقَدْ بَعَثْنَا فِي كُلِّ أُمَّةٍ رَسُولًا اللَّهُ وَاجْتَنِبُ الطَّاغُوتِ I've sent to every nation a messenger calling people to worship Allah alone and to avoid the worship of false gods. This essential message has been preserved in Islam in a way that it was never preserved before. Not because the message was different, because it was the same message, but because of the fact that there would be no other prophets who would come after Muhammad So therefore that message now had to be protected It had to be preserved in a way none of the earlier messages were preserved. I will tell you this, what you say you have come to know 40 years back and what you call the Big Bang is already mentioned in the book which I read, the glorious Quran. It's mentioned 1400 years ago in Surah Ambiya. Chapter number 21, verse number 30, which says, Avalam yaralazine kafuru. Do not the unbelievers see. Anna samawati wal arda. Kaan atarat kanfutak nahuma. That the heaven and the earth were joined together and we clove them asunder. What you're talking about, the Big Bang. I try to imagine compressing a spring. I push it 
closer and closer and closer together, so it's smaller and smaller and smaller. And I've stored a tremendous amount of energy in that spring. And when I let it go, it bursts out, it bursts out, it bursts out. The creation of the universe, which you came to know 40 years back, is already mentioned in this book, The Glorious Quran, 1400 years ago. Who could have mentioned that in the Quran? So the atheists will say, maybe someone wrote, maybe it's a fluke, maybe it's a guesswork. A human being, regardless of who they are, or where they are, or what they do, will have this curiosity. They'll want to know, why am I here? How did I get here? And do I have a purpose? And if so, what is it? The only one who would really be able to answer that question would be the Creator Himself. If there is a Creator, it would be up to Him to tell us why we were created, and what He expects from us, and what this life is really about. Allah has shown the people from the time of Adam until right now has shown the people what he wants from them. And it's a very simple thing. And that is that worship be for him alone without any partners. In fact, we know this life to be a test from Almighty God. That's why we're born and that's why we die because there has to be a beginning and an end for us to be tested on. The next life, after this life, no one will ever die again. A bad person or a good person, both are brought back and they continue to live in the next life, either in good shape or not so good shape, depending on how they did on the test. The worship of the God of Abraham, that was what was taught by these prophets. The Lord of the Arsh and Kursi. We're talking about the Lord of the worlds. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. We're talking about the Lord of the entire universe and beyond. The entire universe and beyond. You know, we live in this dunya and we are fascinated with this dunya which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala indeed has created in a beautiful manner. We're fascinated. There are over billions of people which live on this dunya at this moment in time. Over six billion people that live on the dunya at this moment in time. This dunya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so big that there is space in this dunya for billions and billions and billions or more people. But what is this dunya in comparison to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created out there? This dunya is insignificant. This dunya is meaningless to Allah. It means nothing. It is worthless. So worthless, compare it with the sun. The sun is one star. You know more science than me. You'll be able to tell me better. Take this planet Earth and you place it inside the sun and you will be able to place 1.3 million Earths in the sun. 1.3 million Earths in the sun. Allahu Akbar. Allah is the greatest. The sun is one star. One star. There are stars out there which are millions of times bigger than the sun. You need, you tell me this, that you need millions and millions of stars to make one galaxy. And then you tell me this, that there are zillions of galaxies out there. Let me tell you on top of this, my friend. After this, whatever you see above, whatever you see above, when you raise your head and you look above, whatever you see above, the zillions and zillions and zillions of galaxies, let me tell you, this is everything there is within the first heaven. Everything there is within the first heaven. And Allah is the creator of seven heavens. Seven heavens. And the distance between the first heaven and the second heaven is 500 years. You know, the distance that can be covered in 500 years, at what speed? Only Allah knows. Only Allah knows. But it will take 500 years to get from the first heaven to the second heaven. 500 years from the second to the third, third to the fourth, fourth to the fifth, fifth to the sixth, sixth to the seventh. Every time it will take 500 years. After the seven heavens,
wasi'a kursiyuhu samawati wal ard you all read the ayatul kursi you all know the ayatul kursi after this you have the kursi of allah you have the chair of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you know these seven heavens that we've just talked about in comparison to the kursi of allah they're non-existent they're meaningless Rasulullah has given an example in a hadith just to give us a little bit of understanding with regards to the seven heavens in comparison to the kursi of Allah. Take a ring from your finger, take it off, the small ring that you have, and place it, let's say, in a desert, the Sahara Desert. It's the biggest desert in the world. You know that ring that we take off from our fingers and place it in the Sahara Desert? What, what comparison is in between? the ring and the Sahara Desert. Nothing. Nothing. The seven heavens is the ring and the Kursi of Allah is the Sahara Desert. After the Kursi of Allah, you have the Arsh of Allah. You have the Arsh of Allah. Again, Rasulullah has given, has explained, so just so that we can understand. Take the ring, place it in the desert. This time, the ring is the kursi and the arsh is the desert. What is the kursi in comparison to the arsh of Allah? Nothing. Then you have angels which carry the arsh of Allah. Their heads are in the seventh heaven and their feet are in the lowest earth. My friends, then you have the Lord of the earth. He is beyond the size of Allah, who Allah is, what Allah is. The greatness of Allah is beyond the comprehension of my little mind. This is the being that you and I are messing with. Yeah. <laughs>